Hey nerds, so someone recently asked a question in the comments section to the effect of, if no-till is so great, why isn't everyone doing it? And I thought, that is a very interesting question. And the answer or answers may not be that obvious to the casual observer. Indeed, if no-till does everything it purports to do, from saving labor, to reducing weeds, to managing water better, to improving crop and soil health, well, what gives? Why is not every farm doing the exact same thing? Today, I'm going to give you my thoughts on that and see if I can turn it into a video. So let's do it. First, what constitutes no-till is a huge, often divisive topic, and I have complicated feelings about the term and how it's often defined, as I rambled on about in this video. In fact, a lack of an agreed-upon definition can often lead to great growers doing great things that you never actually hear about because those practices live in that gray area between tillage and no-tillage. So the first answer to this question of if no-till is so great, why aren't more farmers doing it, could be that a lot of farmers are doing it or something like it. It's just they or you or we may not call it no-till. They may call it reduced tillage or minimum tillage or conservation agriculture or regenerative agriculture or minimum disturbance or low till or ecological farming or just no term at all. In effect, there are a lot of really interesting practices going on all over that may not on the surface resemble a no-till system as we typically think of them. I talk about deep composting a lot, but not every farmer has access to large heaps of great compost, so maybe they have to take a slightly different approach to uh, maintaining an arable bed surface that somebody can plant into than somebody who does have access to a lot of compost. There are numerous ways to create a plantable bed surface and simultaneously reduce weeds, uh, protect soil biota, keep the rhizosphere undisturbed, reduce labor, and increase crop productivity, but not all of those methods look like a no-till system. <laughs> Uh, moreover, sometimes what works in, say, eastern Canada may not work in, say, Florida or California or, well, maybe even parts of eastern Canada. Or not everything that works on clay will work on sand and vice versa. And you may not have access to the same materials, like mulching materials, as someone else. Uh, context is everything in farming, so perhaps there are more cool dynamic practices going on than people realize simply because they aren't immediately recognizable as no-till. It is my personal opinion that I would rather see people evaluate their land and available materials and do the best they can to meet the soil's needs than to force a certain ideal practice upon their soil. So maybe that's a little bit of what's going on. Just, you know, keep the soil covered as much as possible, plant it as much as possible, and disturbed as little as you possibly can, right? What that looks like ultimately may not look like no-till to some people, but it could be better in the long run for that specific farm. And if you need some guidance for various practices, uh, you can employ that fit into those principles of soil health, the Living Soil Handbook is designed around those specific principles and may be helpful. Snag one from notillgrowers.com to support these videos. Another more practical reason you may not see more farms doing no-till is that scale complicates things. A farm that produces 30 or 75 acres of mixed vegetables will often have a harder time finding mulch for that scale. So they'll have to get creative with their mulching and tillage reduction. Now you may say, oh, well, they should just use cover crops. Well, yes, but also cover crops come with their own set of complications, as we've talked about in depth on this channel. Uh, they can take up valuable growing time, they can be difficult to terminate, and the ones that winter kill are, or are easy to terminate, don't often make the best mulches. Uh, they can keep the soil cool for a longer period of time going into the spring, that can also make things difficult for somebody that needs to grow early tomatoes in a colder climate, for instance. Many larger scale growers use small amounts of herbicide to kill cover crops. Is that better than lightly harrowing a bare surface? I mean, we sometimes use giant plastic tarps to kill cover crops. Obviously, this idea of what is and is not no-till can get complicated pretty quickly. Another thing that could be considered a reason growers aren't using no-till practices is that the technology for weed management has improved tremendously or at least dramatically. Uh, for instance, a farmer can now till the fields, plant them, and just send a robotic cultivator out 
that can distinguish between weeds and crops using AI. That's real. That's a real thing. Those are already on the market. And those sorts of technologies give farmers less incentive to reduce their tillage. Obviously, they still have the concerns of water retention and soil erosion to worry about, but so long as their yields stay high enough and their labor costs low enough, those will likely stay lesser concerns, for better or worse. Maybe this is uh, painting with too broad of strokes, but technologies are typically designed around making what we already do easier rather than making what we should be doing more accessible. So instead of seeing emerging technologies assisting with, say, the termination of cover crops or the spreading of mulch, we generally just see more weeders. And if there is not an incentive coming directly from the public to reduce tillage, there's not a no-till certification or designation, or there is not a big enough movement of people trying to save the soil, etc., then growers who are getting by doing what they've always done are simply going to continue doing that. They don't have a lot of reason to change. Organic certification for the many, 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 many flaws does give producers more incentive to move away from chemical fertilizers and pesticides because those crops simply fetch more money. No-till crops don't necessarily come with a direct financial incentive in the marketplace, and until you have a system dialed in and the soil health back up and running, any production gains may also take a few years to see. So I guess money, that's one answer. Maybe that regenerative agriculture label will change things, but we'll see. Also, it may require some different machinery to farm on a no-till farm on large scale. Sometimes that machinery can be quite expensive and risky uh, as an investment. So farmers may balk if the systems they're using are working just fine and the turnover to another system would be too expensive. On a larger scale, at least, there may be um, some additional cultural challenges keeping farmers from trying more ecological methods. I don't know how true it is now, but I remember hearing many, many years ago a phrase to the effect of some farmers would rather fail doing the same thing than succeed doing something different. In other words, for a lot of multi-generational farms, to do something different feels like saying what they were doing before was wrong. It feels to them like a slap in the face to their fathers or grandfathers. Uh, but I also know a lot of old school conventional growers who are multi-generational farms who love to try new things here or there and often have a few acres planted in some unique way to just experiment. I think a lot of conventional growers get lumped into this category of people who don't care and just live off the subsidies, but the reality is not that simple. There's a lot more interest in things like regenerative agriculture and a lot more innovation going on in large-scale food production than people may realize. But the challenges are many. We need more people in advisory roles, such as ag extension agents, more well-versed on ecological and low or no-till practices that work well in those regions. It would be nice to see farmers protected from losses incurred by experimenting with no-till methods. That's a subsidy I think we can all rally behind. On a small scale, uh, perhaps some people aren't switching over because they have a system that works for them, uh, that they feel good about. Perhaps they've tried no-till in various ways on their farm and for whatever reason didn't see the returns or effects that they had hoped for. Um, or maybe they don't have access to worthwhile mulches. So they find a minimal tillage system more accessible. In short, I think there is a lot of cool agriculture we don't always see or we don't always hear about because we are looking too closely at the level of disturbance and not closely enough at the big picture. And with that, I think I'm gonna end it. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I'd love to hear why you think farmers do or don't go no-till. Maybe you have personal experience one way or the other. I'd love to hear about it. Uh, otherwise, pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook, a book so named specifically because I wanted to capture more ecological methods than just, you know, no disturbance ever. Anyway, Pick that up at notillgrowers.com to support our work or a hat or other merch. Uh, join our Patreon page at patreon.com slash notillgrowers or just hit that super thanks button. That works too. Like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later, probably including my voice. Bye.